Well, good afternoon or good morning if you're on the West Coast. This is Tom Hood. I'm the CEO of the Maryland Association of CPAs and the Business Learning Institute. And I'm here with a panel of young professionals who have been active in our association and others. And we're going to explore the idea of associations and generations. So first I'm going to introduce them and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, generations and get this conversation going. So with us is Katie Koza, Tammy Bensky, and Barrett Young. And so this notion of generations and associations has a lot to do with this book called Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam. And this book was out a few years ago, but it generated this whole idea that the last generation that really was active and involved in social groups like communities, actually bowling leagues, those kind of things, associations, was the baby boom generation and actually even before that, the silent generation. So we want to explore, like, is that still true? And if so, what's the implication of that? Or explore what these young professionals have to say about that. So if you look over here at our generational map, you'll see right now we've got four generations in the workplace and one more that's coming up. Silent generation, 1925 to 1942. Baby boomers, 1943 to 1960. Gen X, 1961 to 1980. Gen Y, 1981 to 2000. And those are in the workplace. The ones that are coming up now, like my oldest son, Gen Z, they're calling them, 2001 on. Uh, there's also this idea of um, digital natives. You know, you can kind of draw a line under Gen between Gen X and Gen Y. Gen Y are the first uh, generation born on the internet, so they've exhibited a lot of new things coming on. And then there's the quality of life generational issue that's between Gen X and baby boomers. We like to say the baby boomers and up work, uh, live to work. The Gen Xers and Gen Y would like to work to live. So more of a focus on work-life balance, I guess they call it, or integration. So we're going to explore kind of what it means to belong to associations and be active and some of the generational issues that might even be around that. So with that, tell us a little bit about, your, you know, introduce yourself about what you're doing now and what you've been active on recently and that kind of thing. I'm Katie Koza. I work at the Grant Thornton Baltimore office as an audit associate. And I am involved in the New Young Professionals Network here with MACPA. I just became involved with them. Um, I just started working in October, so I've been getting more involved um, with the different committees and events that we have with that. Before that, I was very involved at my college with Beta Alpha Psi, and I coordinated um, some events and meetings with MACPA. And I was also involved with other organizations on campus. I'm Tammy Bensky, and I am a past chair of the Maryland Association of CPAs, and um, actually am the youngest chair that has been um, in office, and looking forward to having someone, maybe someone in this room, taking over that title in the future. Um, I work with Myers and Stauffer, it's a regional accounting firm, um, part of the CBiz group, and I am a manager in the Baltimore office. I uh, primarily work with healthcare clients and enjoy that type of work um, tremendously. I have been extremely active in the Maryland Association, um, culminating, of course, with being the chair, but before that, I was involved with the Structure and Governance Committee and have also served, currently serve on the Nominations Committee and the Ethics Committee. Also involved with the American Institute of CPAs as a member of the, of the uh, Awards Committee there and have also uh, been part of the Governing Council. Um, I was on that for about seven years and that term ended last year. Also part of the insurance, uh, life insurance disability committee and um, have just always enjoyed being active in those associations. My name is Barrett Young. I founded my company, The Green Abacus, in 2012. I do outsource bookkeeping, CFO services, and also business advisory management. Uh, I've been active in Nippon for about three years <clears throat> in the MACPA, about the same amount of time. I now serve on the Nippon board and I also serve on my local chapter board in Southern Maryland chapter of the MACPA, and I'm currently president-elect of that uh, chapter. Uh, let's see what generations we have on our panel here today. So, voila. 
We've got uh, Gen Y, Gen Y, bracketing Tammy as a Gen Xer, and I'm the old guy representing the baby boom generation. Um, I actually, you know, the, volunteer wise, that's how I got to this job actually. So, 1982, I was in a uh, architecture firm, passed the CPA exam, and the first thing the controller uh, told me to do is he said, "You're going to write a check. I'm going to pay for it. Your dues to the AICPA and the MACPA," and signed me up. And then said, you're going to come with me to uh, a meeting. And so he took me to my first MACPA meeting. And I, so I got involved, got on the, the committees, became chair of the association. And then uh, years, years later, uh, I would be finding my company being acquired. The executive director was retiring. And uh, they did a national search and said, you know, put your name in the hat and see what happens. So 15 years later, here I am So uh, in the association. So I've been on the other side as well. So, you know, one of the things I think is, so is this fact or fiction, though? Is your generation less likely to get involved and join things? I don't think so. Um, you know, for me, the reason that I got involved with the association in the first place was because I was encouraged to do so. I think, um, you know, a message that's really important for us to send to um, each and every person out there is if you're involved in the association and you know, you're happy with the experience that you're getting, then you have to bring someone along, similar to the story that you just shared. Uh, with me, it was uh, a goal that my managing partner put on my uh, set of goals for the year. And uh, you know, come the end of the year when my evaluation was going to be performed, I knew that I wanted to be involved with the association, so I could you know literally just check it off as yeah, I did it. And uh, you know, attending one meeting turned into a career full of you know involvement with associations. So I think that um, you know people of my generation want to join. I think at some point, if someone can encourage them um, to come along and and do so, it certainly will help. But my experience has been, um, you know, all it took was someone saying, you know, this is a good organization and, and you should do something with it. Uh, you know, it was, it was my own volition to get involved. You know, yeah. I wanted to do it and continue to want to do it. Okay. Barrett, how about you? I don't think so necessarily. I think maybe formal organizations we might be less likely inclined to join, but I mean, uh, we join organizations all the time. A, a gaming club or something like that online is an organization yeah. in that sense. We want to be around people who share common interests with us. Maybe not formal like a bowling league or something like that, but a group of friends that get together and play paintball or something on the weekend or go snowboarding you know, during the winter. Uh, that's, an, that's an association. Yep. Um, so I definitely see that that hasn't declined. Um, I think we also look for what can, like, like Tammy said, what can we give to that association. We don't want to join, I think, if they don't need us. So we like to join associations where they feel like they've, uh, where we feel they value our gifts, they value our input, um, they are happy when we show up instead of just checking a name off or charging us money when we don't show up or something like that. Gotcha. Katie, how about you? You're, you're the youngest one, just out of college and entering this profession. What's your experience about all this? I can't imagine that it would be this generation wants to get involved, this generation does it. It's probably more on an individual basis. So I'm sure in every generation, I mean, I wasn't really there when some of the older generations were joining these bowling leagues. But <laughs> I mean, I would think that people are people and people want to be around like-minded people. So you're probably always gonna have people in a generation who want to get involved and people who are less inclined to get involved. But I think, if there's a difference in this generation, it's like Barrett said, it's just the manner in which we're getting involved. So people want to be with like-minded people, but maybe they're going to do it in a different manner, such as doing it virtually, as opposed to physically going somewhere and say bowling. Mm -hmm. So, so I mean, I've heard a couple of things from you guys that uh, resonate, that we've heard and see from our work with the, all of you is, is the ability to accommodate you with virtual flexibility, if you will, so that you're not, you know, when I joined, there was a meeting every month and you had to come to the association, no matter how far you drove, that was the, that was the way things were done. And you guys are saying, look, I could come in or I could come in virtually, give me a, a phone dial in or a webcast or, you know, some other way to keep that going. And, you know, Tammy, I know you, you got involved uh, before you became chair 
in this project. And tell us a little bit about that story, because that kind of exemplifies that, right? When we had an over 35 and an under 35 Right. Um, well, like I said before, I had a goal, just a little, as simple as that. It was a goal my managing partner put on my list of goals to, to um, achieve for the year. And when uh, the time came to get that goal checked off the list, miraculously, you know, with two or three days left <laughs> in the year, there was this email that popped up from MACPA. So it said, you know, get involved. We're, you know, examining the structure and governance of our association. And I thought, well, you know, I don't know what this is, and it sounds, you know, kind of heavy, but I need to do this so that, you know, quite frankly, my raise depended on it. So, you know, I replied to the email, and the the uh, task that was put before us was absolutely daunting. It was examine the structure of this organization, tear it down, and put it back together. So it amazed me that the organization would actually trust people who had no prior involvement to actually get into the you know guts of the organization, the bylaws. I mean, literally changing bylaws. Um, so my experience was that you know the Maryland Association of CPAs values input from its members and whether that be the person that showed up at that meeting every single month or the person who is simply sending a check you know it was the value and I felt like I was appreciated I was wanted um, my input was heard and the changes that we made were tremendous so um, you know like Barrett said it's all about it's the value you know at doing this, work that's meaningful. Doing work that's meaningful. That we care about and you care about. Exactly. And you know, at this point in my life where I've got two small kids and, you know, a, a, an office to, to manage, it's extremely important that the time that I give to the association is valuable. It's got to, you know, for me, doing the stuff outside of work hours is more challenging and my, I'm more, you know, discriminating in what I'll actually do to take time away from my family. So if I can, you know, give my time in a way during the day that's meaningful, I'm absolutely going to do it. Yeah. So interesting, you know, different generational issues that, that right. continue. It's got to be, you know, what we've heard is that volunteerism has to really fit you now, right? It, it used to be we had to fit it. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's what I think is also different. Right. And something that came out of that structure and governance um, review was that we needed to find ways, in order to engage more members, we needed to find ways to have members contribute on a somewhat limited time basis. Yeah. So it's not commit to a three-year term for a particular committee where you're stuck with those you know, quarterly or monthly meetings, but that you can sort of swoop in, provide your service, you know, give the talent that you have to any particular topic, yeah. and then get back to life. Yeah. And then when you have time again, you swoop back in, you give your time and talent, and then you you know, get back to other things. And, you know, I remember, and this is true today, one of the big insights from that was our CPA Day program, right? We never really thought of that as volunteerism. Right. And now we had a record of over 200 last time, right? So, you, so CPAs now in Maryland could come for just a half a day, mm -hmm. right. one time, and make a huge impact because it's legislation that affects all of us, and we've had a tremendous success record because of that. Right. So right. we now recognize all those people as volunteers. Active volunteers. People on our listservs, right? We have a tax listserv that's huge, and they don't even have to show up every time. They just put a comment in every once in a while, and right. we count that. So you're right. It's finding those different ways for different people to feel connected and, and give some value and get some value. Right. Barrett, how about you? So young professionals, we just went through our planning system. So mm -hmm. tell, you know, are we doing work that matters? And what's some of the, your observations from all that? I think we are. <clears throat> so the CPA day was one of my first uh, experiences with the MACPA. So you came down to Waldorf and gave a town hall down there. And then less than a month later was this free CPA day thing. Um, that was easy to sign up for because I didn't need any managerial approval for that. Um, but going to that, and I've since been another time, and I plan on going again this January, knowing that just that conversation I was having with my state senator or my state um, assemblyman uh, was an important conversation, and we could see the impact of that right away. Um, I think one of the things that is a barrier to entry for a lot of people with associations is kind of that it doesn't fit me kind of a thing, where if you can tailor the association to something that is interesting, you can get people united around uh, growing mustaches for a month. You can get people united around doing a, a polar bear plunge like the Special Olympics does every year. So it's these kind of, that sounds interesting, it's easy to drop in, 
into. It's not a 24-month commitment to a bowling league. Yeah. It's going to be every single week and the nationals that I have to you know, pay a plane ticket to get to and everything. It's an easy barrier to entry. It's something that interests certain segments of people instead of broad um, interest to everyone. And that's what, kind of what we're trying to do with the Nippin is we're trying to have just one-off kind of happy hours. Committing to come to a happy hour once every quarter is not a commitment to show up to every other happy hour that we have. It's not a commitment to show up to BizTown. Whereas if you like BizTown and don't like happy hour, you might show up to that one because that one suits you better. Yeah. So just different options to different get people options. to help do some things for our profession, right? We always need that workforce. So what's your experience been like just coming in and looking at all this, Katie? What have you been exposed to? What are some of the things you've done? And what, what do you think about some of this stuff? I mean, it just seems really appealing to me to be around movers and shakers. And it seems like someone who is willing to just go after work and go to a happy hour or participate in a community service biz town day get involved, um, try to have an impact on the legislation for CPA Day, even if, you know, being an accountant isn't, like, number one on your mind, you know, 24-7, you're still around people who are energetic, enthusiastic, who aren't just passively living their life. They want to really get involved, and I think that's really important, and it's definitely good to be around people like that. Now, I, I got to ask this question, and uh, Tammy, I, I'm going to really look to you first and, and Barrett next about this, but when you, you know, when you were doing that governance and structure, you were really a young pup, right? Yes. And, and so what was it like, you know, coming to our board and presenting, and did the, did the old guys in the room, how do you feel they received what you had to say, and how did that work? How did you guys feel the, other, the older generation dealt with you? Well, um, <clears throat> The, the particular committee that I was involved in, there was a younger group and an older group. So the work of the committee was very easy in that we were all new. We were all, you know, kind of working together as a team of um, similar ages and backgrounds. Coming to the board meeting at first was pretty intimidating. Um, at the time, I think it may have been 20, so, 22 <laughs> board members, yeah. and um, it was a very... Uh, I don't want to say not diverse, but it was, you know, everyone Old in that room. Guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that what he said. Um, but, you know, really everyone in that room I could look to as like, okay, that could be my boss one day. You know, there really was no peer connection. <clears throat> what I found was um, I had a very positive experience when I came in to give the report, you know, the first time. Um, you know, everyone was really genuinely interested in what I had to say. And the feedback was so positive and so encouraging. And you know, well, we are really interested in hearing what you have to say at the next meeting. You know, good work and keep it up, and and that sort of thing. And I guess from that positive experience at the board meeting, it was smooth sailing. You know, from that point on. And you know, it really goes back to if you feel like the work that you're doing is meaningful and you're appreciated, then you're going to keep doing it. Yep, makes sense. Barrett, yeah. how about you? What's been your exposure with? Some of uh, you know my generation and my colleagues who are in leadership roles and stuff. Are we are we listening? Are we paying attention? You're listening and teaching. So one of my, one of my favorite experiences is the town hall you did down in Southern Maryland last year. So not my first, but my second. Um, it was about halfway through the session that you started to get into the generational type stuff. And and up until that point, I had been participating, raising my hand, offering insight and stuff like that. We'd been talking back and forth. Other people were listening. And then you had this moment where you have everybody stand up in the town hall, and then you say, if you're a silent generation, sit down. If you're a baby boomer, sit down. If you're Generation X, sit down. And me and one other person were the only two Gen Ys in the room of uh, 60 or 70 people standing up at this thing. And I could hear like an audible gasp, like <laughs> where it was kind of funny, but it, cut, it cemented for me because I had something valuable to offer. Instead of leading with, I'm Generation Y, therefore you should listen to me. I led with, I have something valuable to offer, oh, and I'm Generation Y. I think that that yeah. really helped to break down some of that barrier yeah. between us. Good stuff. Now, Katie, I know down at Salisbury, we do those, uh, one of my favorite things is town hall meetings with our members and the students. So what's your exposure to that? You've been to a couple of those, and do you think the, what, what was the reaction from the older generation in your mind, and how's that been, and even in, since then, in your workplace and everything? Um, I think different people are more excited to get input from young people. Um, I think you personally, I think you really like to get the input from young people. I think other um, members sometimes they have a son or daughter, so they just 
they don't they kind of take Treat take us like, for granted i don't know how they are treat as, you like your parents <laughs> yeah it's, it's not as um they don't seem like they're as excited or oh let's really hear what these um young people have to say which i mean i don't think i should get special treatment just because i'm new to the workforce i don't really always know even if my input is like if they really even want to know it so so it's mixed now, interesting enough, you know, the, story, the rest of the story from Tammy's piece is they obviously listened because they adopted, I think, everything you recommended. Yeah. Um, we ended up changing our bylaws, changing our structure, our board. We're now, we now have our third young professional who's been chair, right, yeah. since you. So you, yeah. Kimberly, and now Byron. Right. So I think we've probably had more young professionals leading this association than any, uh, any other organization that I know of. So we're kind of really proud of that fact. And... You know, I think there is a message here for everyone. This is, you know, in the generational research, right, the idea isn't that they should have special uh, privilege because they're young, mm -hmm. but the fact is they've got things to, of value to contribute. And it's the, when everyone contributes, we end up with a much better thing. That's what happened in our case, the under 35 group and the over 35 group collaborated and we came up with a really good answer that helped mm -hmm. everyone. We didn't get rid of all the traditional things that the baby right. boomers loved. We did an and, and we added things that the younger generation wanted. And I think you know there's a option for you guys to do that uh, at your workforce as well. There's a study <laughs> called Where the Winners Meet, Why Happier, More Successful People Gravitate Toward Association. Now, I think personally at Maryland, we've been very um, lucky to have folks like you guys uh, involved and continue to be involved. But they had three things in this report that I want to hear your reaction to. They said that on average, this is you know big survey thing, um, members in associations earned higher salaries than people who weren't joined to an association, uh, to about ten thousand dollars more per year. Uh, number two is they said that that those professionals in associations like their jobs more measurably than those not in associations, and then number three that the the people in associations were happier people when they measured their scale by a big chunk than people not in associations. What's your reactions to those three things? Um, so earn higher, they love their jobs more, and they're happier people. So it's kind of, it's difficult, you know, do people who are looking for higher incomes go to associations or do people who go to associations look for higher incomes? Uh, I don't know which one comes first, but uh, I do think that people do earn higher salaries when they associate with each other. So the obvious one is you're talking to your peers and you're finding out what they're making and then you're finding new job <laughs> offers and things like that. <laughs> but the better one is it, it causes you to love your profession more. I honestly believe that when I started associating with the MACPA, it caused me to really put a lot more stock and value into CPA instead of just being I'm a tax preparer, you know, no different than the CPA firm down the road. It's like I'm a CPA. This is like a 110 year tradition kind of a thing uh, in the MACPA. Uh, so it caused me to value my services better, which also caused me to, uh, to communicate that value to my customers better. So another network that I'm a part of um, is Thrival. It's a CPA network uh, across the country. And so when I started Thrival, when I was talking about launching my own company, I was going off of you know, what my hourly billing rate had been at previous employers, and I was going to start with that. But since then, you know, we've had conversations about value billing. We've had conversation, uh, value pricing. Uh, sorry, Ron Baker. Uh, value pricing and conversations about where value comes from and things like that, where I can say today that the rates that I charge my customers today for a regular services are probably three to four times higher than I was thinking just one year ago. Wow. And that's because of the value of that association, because the value that the MACPA provides by making me value being a CPA even more. Cool. I completely agree. I think when you are in an association, it makes you feel more like a part of the bigger picture and you can see where you fit in as opposed to being just one person solitary you you feel more like you're part of a community right. and mm -hmm. um, it makes you more confident it makes you hold your head higher walk with a pep in your step when you are doing other things and success begets success so I think it bleeds out to other aspects of your life which is why um, I mean you probably would have a happier life all around just by accelerating in one area of your life. Good, interesting, interesting. Tammy. Yeah, and I agree. I think that um, the study definitely brought back some valid results um, as far as being 
happier, liking your job more. I have to say that you know the network that I've created through my involvement in association has really given me the opportunity to have a sounding board of such talented people. Things um, you know as specific as you know what are you paying your interns or you know what sort of benefits are you providing you know in this area that type of thing. It's just it's it's an access to people and. Um, positions in this industry, in our profession, I should say, that are, you can't find that unless you have the association network that you create through years of experience here. Um, as far as being paid higher, I think, um, you know, someone, I guess I can only use myself as an example, I feel like that the motivation that I've displayed through getting involved with an association has is consistent in the workplace and I've always been motivated um, you know within the associations that I'm involved in to you know go higher and higher and higher and you know I always wanted that next you know committee and I always wanted that next office and I you know just kept going until eventually reaching you know the top of this 12,000 member organization and um, you know in in my firm same thing you know I'm just a motivated person and I'm going to keep going so you know that has to translate to higher salary, yeah. and um, and you know, like you said, being part of something makes you feel just happier all around. You know, for me, it definitely gives me a lot of pride in my profession. Going to CPA Day, you know, that one day a year, you walk in and you are just surrounded by people who are passionate about the same thing, and the results that we get. You know, when the legislators walk in and they see this room full of their constituents who are you know loud and proud CPAs you know it's just a really powerful thing the association brings to its members and we get a lot done which is and even we cooler. get a lot so done we help the profession yes. we help you guys I mean yeah. that's pretty neat you know I, and I, I heard you guys talking about this but the, it, it's kind of like we're the way the survey works we're not sure whether it's cause or effect right like whether you know happy motivated people are the ones who want to join associations or the association helps them and I think it's kind of like the engine and the fuel it gives you like, like both ways. Well, absolutely. And when you when you start out, like with me, when I started out, it's like, okay, I have to do this because I was told to do this. But then, as your, or as I was, um, you know, encouraged and got that, you know, positive feedback, it just made me want to do more. Yeah. So there's definitely the chicken and the egg effect going on. Yeah. But I clearly hear, you know, work that matters is clearly what your generation wants to have. In our generation, it was more like we just had, you know, we just did it. Um, we liked when it was meaningful, but we would just do it to get started. I think this is a good case where we have to think about it. And it's true for the workplace as well as it is for associations. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to wrap up. I think you guys have dispelled that myth that, you know, the bowling alone idea. I think that you guys are active in lots of things, and they're things that appeal to you in different ways and different ways of doing it, which is uh, also key. But so last thing would be what advice, if you had to write a little piece of advice on a 3 by 5 card for all the young professionals that are watching today, and maybe even their bosses, either one, what would that be? What would that be? What would be your three by five to everyone? I'll start. I think it's really important to know where your coworkers are coming from. So it really will help you to ask them what their expectations of you are. And also, if you feel that there is a generational disparity, um, really just having an open conversation um, about their expectations and goals. Am okay. I making sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I think you're right. So it's like, don't take things for granted. Don't assume, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Don't stereotype. Just ask, right? So have a conversation about what, how do you best want to work together is really where I'd start. And mm -hmm. how am I doing communicating to you, that kind of thing. So great stuff. Okay. Yeah, I was sort of think, thinking along the same lines. Um, for me in my workplace, I have employees who are 60 and I have employees who are just out of college in their early 20s. So for me, I always need to keep an open mind. Um, the way to motivate someone who is 60 and older is completely different than how to motivate someone you know, who's just out of college. And the funniest thing that, um, just a funny example that I, that I think of when I think of advice and keeping an open mind is many of our younger uh, staff people always work with iPod headphones. And I think, you know, how do you get anything done that's so distracting and, you, you know, I, it drives me crazy. But at the same time, when I approached, you know, one of our staff people, I said, how, yeah, how do you work with these iPod earphones in your ears? Doesn't it ruin your concentration and cause distraction? And he said, well, actually, it, it 
helps me concentrate. So I think the the really you know important thing to do when dealing with people in um, different generations is just keep an open mind, ask the questions when you have you know have them, and um, you know be willing to adapt. It's not about being in the office from eight to five, it's about getting the work done. It's about you know working in an environment where everyone is you know appreciated and valued, and in the end, your clients are satisfied. And yeah. that happens. There's there's multiple ways to get to the ending result. Good good advice, yeah. Barrett. So my advice always comes back to what I would have told myself um, when I was a staff accountant, and it's kind of you know are we happier because we associate. So 2010, Tom, when you came along with your town hall, I was actually in grad school to completely swap out of this profession. Um, I had just become a CPA, but I did not see a future in it. Um, so I was considering other options because the profession that I was in, uh, or the, the workplace that I was in, just did not seem like it was going forward anywhere. Um, I was the only staff accountant at that company. I was the only person under 35 at that company. Before I met the MACPA, I didn't know there were other accountants <laughs> under 35 <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the state. Um, but my, my word of advice to myself and, and kind of what you said in that town hall is you're not alone. You know, even if you are working for an employer uh, where you feel alone, you have peers out there and you can find them through the MACPA online, you know, through Twitter or LinkedIn or something like that, through the happy hours that we host. You're not alone, um, and just knowing that you're not alone can sometimes make it uh, give you more purpose and more sense of what you're doing there. Yep. Because if you're able to associate with like-minded CPAs online or monthly or quarterly, it reduces sometimes this pull that I have to work with like-minded CPAs all the time. Yep. Um, and that and that's very valuable, I think. Well, awesome. So, uh, you know, as, as you look about around, there's there's 50 state CPA societies, the American Institute of CPAs. Uh, there's the National Association of Black Accountants, American Society of Women Accountants. Lots of ways for you to associate uh, and take advantage of some of the things that these folks have said. So we're, we're certainly really lucky. We hope you have the, a great rest of the conference out there at uh, Accounting Web and beyond. So thank you guys very much.